Here's my most crazy encounter for you all. So about three years ago, I was going to school in a U.S. city and was living with two other roommates. My one roommate was known to usually bring seedy characters back to the apartment. At one point during our fall semester, she befriended a guy in her advertising class who went by the name of Dallas. He became her weed dealer, and she would frequently bring him over to the apartment. I suspected they were sleeping together, but she denied it. It was a strange relationship, but who am I to judge? My other roommate and I thought he was charismatic enough, but also didn't see the appeal that Christy, my roommate who befriended him, saw. I remember one night we had Dallas over for dinner. He told us how he played for our college's football team, and that he just started his own business at the age of 25. He was a very well-known weed dealer who made a shit ton of money, and his name was Dallas because he used to live in Dallas, Texas, and his parents named him after that. Me and my other roommate nodded our heads and listened, but we didn't think much of it except for this dude thought he was hot shit and wanted to gloat about himself. Mind you, he was about five foot four and probably not over 150 pounds. I believe he came over for dinner or something maybe one or two other times. My roommate claimed that one time she decided to buy weed from him and went off to his apartment off campus. And when she arrived, she saw our roommate Christy pass the fuck out on a chair in the middle of the day in Dallas's apartment in some random room. When my roommate arrived, he mentioned nothing of her being there. My roommate shook her awake, and Christy woke up in a haze and basically told my roommate to fuck off. My roommate recounted the story to me, and we both agreed that it was really weird, and Dallas was probably not the safest person to hang around with. After a couple of months, Christy stopped hanging with him too. I remember her saying he got pissed she didn't want to sleep with him. I also found out that a friend of hers, who knew him for a long time, was engaged to him. Oh, also, his real name wasn't Dallas. What a shocker there. Fast forward two years. Me nor my roommate talked to Christy anymore. We're living elsewhere in said city, doing our own thing. We get an alert on our phones that a girl who had just transferred to our college went missing after leaving from one of the campus bars the previous night. It doesn't take long, maybe a few days when this huge story breaks. This girl was killed by someone she left the bar with that night. My roommate calls me up and says, Dude, do you remember what Dallas's real name was? Yeah, I believe it was... And I said his name. Go online and read this article. He fucking killed that girl that went missing. Sure enough, I go online, and there is the most horrifying mugshot of Dallas, next to a photo of the girl he had just slain. It gets crazier. Apparently he had taken her home that night, an attempt at a one-night stand sort of deal, I assume. And I guess at one point things turned bad and he killed her by blunt force and strangulation. If that isn't terrible enough, he cleaned up the evidence in his apartment, threw her body in a storage container, and took a lift to his grandma's house hours away. He buried the storage container with the remains in it on the property somewhere. After obtaining a video of the two of them leaving together from the bar, it didn't take the cops long to bust his murdering ass. Weeks after the story broke, so many girls came forward and shared similar creepy stories about Dallas, the guy who played for said college's football and ran a successful business. You can guess that none of this was ever true. He was like 28 years old, claiming he was still a student at our college when this happened, prying on younger women. It's truly a terrible story what happened to that young girl. So Dallas... I hope you rot in jail for the rest of your life. I'd like to begin by describing myself. 
because I believe it's relevant to the story. I have to assume that I'm not the average author on here. I'm a 25-year-old male and a bit above average height. I've been doing sports five to six times a week since I graduated high school. Gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high-altitude mountaineering boots, because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break my boots in last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my grandpa's birthday, and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots are a bit overkill for these woods, but I still needed to try them. I selected a nice route that's about 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It had rained just the day before, so I expect there a fair amount of mud and not so many people as they're easily scared off by the weather. Since the summer was excruciatingly hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not-so-distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and doesn't enjoy long-distance walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on a short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up I would be doing the hike all alone. The first half of the hike was perfect. The altitude difference along the trail is minimal, and I barely broke a sweat. I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most six or seven people during the two or three hours, and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks. There are deer and wild boar in these woods. Nothing more menacing. Not animals, anyway. But I won't get too ahead of myself. Between twelve and one, the path ran into an actual road one where cars can go. The road is asphalt, but deep in the forest and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go there. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I heard a car approach from behind me. It went past me, not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older green SUV with a fresh registration, you can tell by the license plate, probably an import. I thought nothing of it at the time, but then I heard it come back. It drove past me a second time, now very slowly, and I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble and beard game going on as well. I assumed they were gamekeepers, even though those cars have a crest on the hood and both front doors. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things and I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this. They have jeeps which are much more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort, and again I thought nothing of it. Then, my trail left the asphalt road and began snaking into the woods again. I walked ahead serenely, gazing at trees and whatnot. And then I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. An engine sound was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point, the trail was quite narrow. But if, for whatever reason, you wanted to drive a car on it, you could just about. Now, when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically right in my face. It was an arm's length away from me, and it had stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver who was staring back, as I can only assume since he was wearing sunglasses. I calmly asked him, What's wrong? Shall I let you go first? In a polite tone as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing and soon disappeared behind a curve. 
Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that he was alone in the car, unlike earlier. I listened intently, standing still since I wasn't sure what was going on. At this point I wasn't scared, but there was a faint feeling of unease in the air, and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car and the engine stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but I heard nothing from that point on. I turned around and began walking towards my destination, at a much faster pace than before. Now I was a bit scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again or to see him for that matter. I had just walked enough for these unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to go take a piss. I saw a perfect spot, a very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I don't know what they're called in English. Wooden structures a couple meters tall, very simple, where hunters can sit and wait for their prey. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up it, and began to do my business. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I also had a sip of water. I had been camping there for a few minutes before I headed back to the trail from where I deviated to take a leak. Right before I arrived back on the main trail, I thought to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind. No noise of any kind. Absolutely nothing. This made me realize just a moment later how alone I was. Except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail, in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back onto the trail, since the small one to the tower was well hidden by trees and you couldn't see it from the main road, as it was running perpendicular to the small one. I looked at him and was instantly chilled to the very bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing, with a baseball hat on his head. The only reason he was standing still, I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident with the SUV, I probably would have just walked along the trail thinking he was a hunter. However, in the light of the strange encounter with the SUV, from which the second man was missing, something in me snapped instantly. In hindsight, it's also illegal to hunt in these woods at this time of year. I figured, in the matter of two seconds, that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion, towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf or the other's, He'd just think I was an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I was right, it's the best call I'll ever have made. And for fuck's sake, he began running towards me. Adrenaline blossoming within me, I began to sprint away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was exhausted. It must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails, but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for a signal, but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while, I began to power walk, but still off trail, straight ahead, in a direction I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone got a signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot. You must have misunderstood the situation. Well, I'll let you guys decide for yourselves if I did or not. Finally, I reached the trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this rather large forest. It felt like eternity but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to a station near my car, 
rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in, and drove home. My dog welcomed me like I was coming back from a two-year deployment. Dogs are just amazing. She must have felt that something had shaken me up. I spent the afternoon contemplating my life in the bathtub. The boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for long periods of time. I called the forest gamekeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I came across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs. 99% of the time, they're alone. I told them my story, and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me that the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been reading the local news, but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet. I really hope nothing will be either. Just a heads up, this is a long story that involves some violence. I apologize if I'm posting this in the wrong spot, but it has elements of stalking, and I was terrified by this person for quite some time. This happened about ten years ago when I was in college. I was a sophomore, about nineteen or twenty-year-old female, and I was horribly naive. The college I went to was a religious school. This is partly the reason this problem continued on as long as it did, and had several rules that students had to follow. The rules important to the story are, no drinking on campus, you could only visit the opposite sex in their room during visitation hours, and during visitation the door had to be left open. I was not an unattractive girl and happened to draw the attention of a guy who shared the same major as I did. This means that we had a bunch of classes together. He introduced himself to me as Andy, and we began talking. He was very tall, about six foot four and quite heavy. At one point, he weighed about 300 pounds. He expressed romantic interest in me, but I wasn't attracted to him, and told him this whenever he brought it up. He would immediately backtrack and say how happy he was being my friend, and he didn't mind that I didn't care about him romantically. I did get along very well with him though, and we hung out just the two of us very frequently. The other people in our classes began to expect to see us together, and we became fast friends. Andy had a girlfriend when we met who attended another school. He broke up with her during the summer break between freshman and sophomore year. But unbeknownst to me, the reason for the breakup was that he wanted to start pursuing me more actively. When I came back from summer break, something had changed. Andy became more forward towards me, often making comments about how pretty I was and that I should be with him. I began to become uncomfortable with the attention and told him so many times. I unfortunately didn't want to lose him as a friend since he was one of only a few friends that I actually hung out with. A lot of those friends I met through him, so if I cut him off, I would have no one close to to talk to. Andy would often swing wildly from charming and sweet to insulting and manipulative. He would offer to take me places and help me with things, then say that I owed him something in return for those things. He would say we were so close and we should just date, since we were practically together all the time. Alcohol made it worse. I tried to avoid drinking with him, but it did happen occasionally, either off campus or sneakily while in his dorm room. He sometimes used my past relationships to manipulate me into feeling guilty. As a religious person, I had committed a cardinal sin by sleeping with the two guys I had previously dated before meeting Andy. He brought this up a lot, implying that I was damaged goods because of this. At one point, he told me, I'm the best man that you could possibly get because of your past. Eventually, I caved and told him I'd date him just to see if there was any feelings there whatsoever. This, of course, made him ecstatic, but it also made him extremely overprotective of me and jealous of any attention I received from anyone of the opposite sex. 
He would call and text me constantly, and if I didn't pick up the first time, he would call me until I did. He constantly questioned where I was going to be, and would follow me there if possible. I worked for the college as a short-order cook at their late-night grill, and Andy would wait for me to get off work almost every night. He would sit at one of the tables for hours, just waiting for me to finish my shift. It began to creep me out, but I chalked it up to him being an overprotective boyfriend. We did eventually have sex, but I was still not physically attracted to Andy, and I was essentially waiting for him to finish every time we did the deed. He made me feel like it was a necessary part of our relationship, and that because I slept with my exes, I also needed to sleep with him. Despite this, I did genuinely enjoy his company in our conversations when he wasn't being possessive. We tried being in a relationship for two months, until Christmas break rolled around. When I went home, I had a chance to clear my head and speak to my family about the situation. My mom especially seemed uncomfortable with how frequently Andy contacted me, and it got way worse while we were apart. He got a hold of my family members' Facebook pages and phone numbers, and he would call or message them whenever I didn't immediately answer his calls or texts. It got to the point where he was calling me upwards of ten times a day, and I had hundreds of texts from him. This was a time where you had to pay for a certain number of texts per month, and no matter how many times I told him that he was using up my texts, he would still message me. I honestly couldn't afford this relationship anymore. After thinking long and hard about it, I called him up. I told him how I felt, and that I thought this relationship wasn't working. I said the cliched phrase, I still want to be friends, and I genuinely meant it. And he flipped out. He began calling and messaging me even more frequently than before, at all hours of the day and night, swinging wildly from, You broke my heart. Please come back to me. To, How dare you, you stupid bitch. I deserve way better than you. And back again. I had no clue what to do. I dreaded returning to school. When the day finally came and I went back to campus, Andy sought me out. He would freak out on me for no reason, curse at me and call me names, and then apologize profusely. His attitudes would change frequently, sometimes the next day and sometimes even the next hour. Despite all of this, he still waited for me outside of work. He still followed me back to my dorm. He still walked with our group of friends to and from class. When they were around, he would pretend to want to be friends then wait until we were walking alone and start in on me. He would push me, or step on the back of my heels while I was walking, and mock me. Then when I complained, he would say he was just joking. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was showing all of these warning signs, and I was too stupid and naive to pick up on them. I did tell him I thought we needed to spend some time apart, and that worked for a short while. Andy eventually seemed to even out, and a few weeks later invited me to his dorm room to play video games with him as a peace offering. When I arrived, he snuck me in the back way, so he didn't have to leave the door open. He offered me a drink. This made me nervous, but I was an underage college student, so far be it from me to turn down an alcoholic beverage. Everything seemed to be going alright. We were getting along and joking around, so I got more comfortable. I had another drink, and very quickly after this, I started to feel exceedingly tired and had trouble standing. I don't know if he was topping off my drink when I wasn't looking, or if, God forbid, he had put something in my drink. There was no way I was leaving that room that night. Andy became very accommodating and arranged for me to crash on his couch. I agreed, but I could tell something wasn't right so I told him in a drowsy voice while slurring my words that under no uncertain terms was he to try anything sexual that night. He laughed it off but agreed, and the last thing I remember is curling up on the couch and falling asleep. I don't need to tell you what happened that night while I was passed out. The next morning when I found out I was horrified. I yelled at Andy, who laughed it off as something funny that I brought on myself by drinking. Then I left. I went to my dorm room across campus, crawled into bed, and cried. I skipped classes that day and stayed in my room the whole time. 
I called out of work. I didn't want to do anything or see anyone. I didn't tell anyone what happened then, and I honestly didn't know that what happened was considered sexual assault until months later. At some point during the afternoon, Andy just tried to sneak into my room. I freaked out and started yelling at him to get the fuck out. He apologized and told me he just wanted to drop off some things, and he didn't think I'd be here. He had a hot water bottle and some flowers. He kind of threw them in the room and shut the door as I yelled at him to leave me alone. A couple months went by, and Andy still followed me sometimes, but I told him to back off. He still messaged me, but I mostly ignored him. He followed me off campus on multiple occasions, and I also learned that he had been following me around for quite some time. I began to develop anxiety about seeing him everywhere, and went to the campus doctor. I explained parts of the story to him, and he gave me some Xanax and antidepressants to help with my paranoia. I tried my best to function, but my grades suffered and so did my friendships. By this point, I had maybe three friends left who didn't think I was this horrible person that led Andy on, then dumped him and broke his heart. The icing on the cake for me, I know, I know, it should have been being assaulted, was when Andy crashed my birthday party. Apparently, he asked one of my friends if he could help plan it, but she didn't know that we weren't on speaking terms, so she agreed. He showed up to the park where it was being held, drank all the alcohol, then began telling my few friends that I still had how much of a bitch I was. He called me a whore. He told them I let him on and broke his heart, and the entire evening was ruined. Unfortunately, he was too drunk to drive himself home, so I was nominated to bring him back by driving his car. I mentioned I didn't want to do this by myself, so a friend offered to ride with me to help carry him back to his dorm room, but immediately after that she booked it. She left me alone with him in his dorm room, even though I told her I was extremely uncomfortable being alone with him. She knew some of what happened, but I think she figured I was being dramatic or exaggerating. Immediately after she left, all of a sudden he wasn't that drunk anymore. He turned hostile and threatening. He told me if I didn't stay with him he would hurt himself and pulled out a pair of scissors. He held the blade of the scissors to his wrist, and I took a step back. I was at a loss of what to do in the situation, so I simply stated that he shouldn't hurt himself, but that I really wanted to leave. I backed up and slowly went to the door, but he jumped up, dropped the scissors, and grabbed my wrist. He yanked me back from the doorway and twisted my arm behind my back until I cried out. He then threw me against the wall face first, slammed the door shut and locked it. He picked me up and tossed me onto his bed. I was terrified, but I told him if he didn't let me go, I would scream. He covered my mouth with his hand and told me if I screamed, I would get in trouble for violating visitation. He said he was going to let me up if I promised to stay in the room with him. I tried to portray that I was calm and relaxed, but inside I was scared for my life. I thought if I stayed, he would try to assault me again, or worse. I agreed to stay with him, and he let me up off the bed. I sat up with all the strength I could muster, and I smiled. I said I would be okay hanging out with him, but I really had to use the bathroom. He agreed, but told me not to take too long. He said he'd be waiting outside the door. The dorm bathroom was actually a shared bathroom between two dorms. In Andy's room, there was a door to the right that led to the bathroom. Then if you walked through the bathroom, there was another door on the opposite side that led to another dorm room. Both bathroom doors could be locked from the outside to prevent someone from one dorm using the bathroom to access the other dorm room. I went into the bathroom and closed Andy's door, then prayed the guys who lived in the next dorm room were trusting enough to leave the bathroom door unlocked. I walked to the other side and tried the doorknob. Miraculously, it turned and I opened the door into the room of two very surprised guys. I apologized and mumbled. I just needed to get out of there, before turning to leave. They both stared incredulously at me as I ran out of their front door. I left that residence hall and ran all the way across campus to my dorm. All of a sudden I heard footsteps behind me, and heard someone shouting my name. My heart sank. It was Andy. I panicked, but the hall that housed my dorm room was directly ahead of me. I picked up the pace and Andy followed suit. 
He was gaining on me, and it had been ages since I ran. I could see the entrance to my dorm. I had my key out and grabbed the door handle of the first set of doors. There were two sets of doors that led into my residence hall. The first one was always unlocked, but the second set you needed a key for. When I got inside the first set of doors, Andy caught up to me and grabbed me by the arm. He tried to use his weight advantage to pull me back away from the second set of doors and out the entrance. I fought with everything I had, yelling at him to let me go the whole time. I saw through the dorm window that there were people inside the foyer, and if I could just get their attention, I could get one of them to open the door. I finally managed to get close enough to the second set of doors to knock. The instant I knocked on that door, Andy let me go. He walked away quickly, letting a few choice curse words fly in my direction before jogging back in the direction he came. When a guy came from inside the foyer and opened the door, he saw a girl who was out of breath and on the verge of tears. He asked me if I was okay, and I said I think so, then waved him away. I ran up to my dorm room and locked the door immediately. The very next day, I contacted my RA about the situation. I showed her some of the messages Andy had sent me, and explained that he had broken visitation by coming into my dorm to drop stuff off for me, and that he had just chased me across campus. She was immediately concerned and contacted the Dean of Discipline. They instituted a ban on Andy being allowed to enter my dorm, and I told him to stay away from me and not to contact me anymore. It took him a long time to even begin to comply. I should have gone to the police, but when I met with the Dean of Discipline, he strongly encouraged me to keep everything in-house. He said, We're a family and we'll deal with this internally like a family should. I didn't learn this until years later, but this is the attitude of many colleges when dealing with victims of stalking and assault who attend their schools. Eventually, over the summer, I told my mother most of the details of what happened, and she cried with me. She was extremely supportive, and drove me five hours to the police department in the town where my college was located so I could file a report. They basically said since it had been too long since the assault, there wasn't much they could do, but I could try to get a restraining order. I followed the directions and was able to get one against Andy. He violated the order several times, and it ended up going back to court. The court put so many restrictions on him that he ended up having to transfer to another college while I finished my degree. When I graduated, I got out of there and never looked back. I returned to my hometown where I moved back in with my family and got a decent job. I've dealt with anxiety, depression, and extreme paranoia since then and for a while I was terrified he would find me again and finish what he started. I got a firearm card, and bought a handgun that I keep under my nightstand for protection. I've never had to use it outside of practicing in a range, fortunately. I eventually found a fantastic guy who's amazing, sweet, kind, and very understanding of my past. We're now married, and I've never been happier. I'm so glad I got out of that situation. Many women aren't as lucky.